a very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our viewers who have joined from different parts of the world. As you all know, in the wake of the ongoing coronavirus disease crisis, the convener and international steering committee members of the 10th Asia-Pacific Conference on Reproductive and Sexual Health and Rights, or what we call APCR SHR 10, had decided that the conference will evolve from an in-person one to an ongoing virtual series under the name of APCR SHR 10 Virtual. Starting from today, this online series will feature 14 thematic online sessions, each of about 90 minutes duration during June to December 2020, with plenary speakers and top ranking abstract presenters sharing their insights around sexual and reproductive health and rights and sustainable development goals in the Asia Pacific regional context. Starting from today, these online sessions, which are co hosted by APCR SHR 10, Reproductive Health Association of Cambodia, and CNS, will be live streamed every fortnight from June to December on Facebook page of APCR SHR 10 and CNS. I would now like to invite Dr. Shivon Var, Executive Director of Reproductive Health Association of Cambodia and convener of APCR SHR 10 to declare open this virtual dialogue series. Dr. Var holds a medical doctorate and master of public health degrees and has more than 20 years of leadership and top management experience in the field of sexual and reproductive health and maternal newborn child health. He is among the first Cambodians to start and expand family planning and youth health programs in Cambodia. And he has introduced innovative approaches in addressing women and child health in the community. Over to you, Dr. Bar. Good afternoon and, and good day. Uh, I'm honored to be here again today with you. And it is my uh, privilege to have the opportunity to speak during this um, important conference on sexual and reproductive health and rights. And it is more so during the time of this uh, pandemic. And I am grateful and hopeful that even during this difficult time, we all continue to join hand in hand and continue to take action on the matters which affect each human life, in particular, the marginalized vulnerable population, from pregnancies to birth deliveries to old age. It is not only about medical technology, but more than this are the social constructs, norms, politics, which continue to impact SRHR. As the convener of the 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive Sexual Health and Rights, I would like to welcome you all to a virtual conference. As many of you know, and as we have informed the public through conference website and social media, and due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the International Steering Committee decided to change in-person conference which was planned to be held late May this year to this virtual conference. This virtual conference will be held every fortnight as Shoba just mentioned, starting today and run through the end of 2020. So please check the conference website for subsequent dates and subjects for virtual conference. I hope we all will benefit from this series of dialogues in which experts, advocates, activists, supporters, representatives from specific groups, including young people, LGBT people, and people with disability, will join the discussions and bring the SRHR agenda forward. And we continue the momentum which the government, UN agency, CSO, and private groups made during the Nairobi summit on ICPD 25 in November last year. We continue to translate the commitment, the Nairobi summit, of the Nairobi summit, and to address the SIHR issue in Asia and the Pacific. 
I hope we all will benefit from this series of dialogue in which expert, advocate, activist, supporter to come together and discuss. And I would like to take this opportunity to briefly about the background which are leading us to this virtual conference. This conference has been held every two years for those who've been new to the conference for the past 20 years. With the first conference was held in 2001 in the Philippines. With the support from the national and international steering committee members who are experts from across the region, right as the convener of the 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive Sexual Health and Rights, has made the preparation for the conference since 2018. Our theme for this conference is SIHR in Asia Pacific. 2030 SDG vision and 2020 reality. To bring the themes alive and meaningful to guide our actions, this virtual conference focus on 14 different sub-themes, ranging from today's sub-themes on addressing barrier to accelerate progress on SIHR in Asia Pacific, to safe abortion, young people and SIHR, climate change, population aging, and humanitarian responses. I think the humanitarian responses is uh, very le relevant, in particular during this uh, pandemic time. And other themes include sexual and gender-based gender violence, and innovation and changing norm around SIHR in Asia and Pacific. So I would like to encourage you to visit the website for the detailed information of the conference uh, announcement. Through our preparation and call for abstract submission, we received approximately 1,000 abstract submission in addition to many applications for satellite session, lunch and evening time, symposium and booth. Unfortunately, all the works and effort which we all made was greatly impacted by the pandemic. But with this virtual conference, we are able to make the conference alive. We invite selected abstract submission authors, speakers to participate and share their experience. We will also allow interaction from the audience to enrich our conversation. I hope that this series of virtual online conference will serve the conference purpose of broadening and influencing good policies and best practices for SIHR, enabling marginalized and disadvantaged people with a better environment in which to exercise their right. I hope this virtual conference still meaningfully provide a platform. This conference still provide a a platform for SIHR stakeholders to share successes and lessons learned, share SIHR cutting edge research in clinical technology, service delivery, population and sustainable development, share evidence-based practices in advocacy, policy, financing governance and accountability, strengthen partnership and open opportunity for a new alliance in SIHR. I hope so, even though we do this in a um, um, online uh, conference. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank the, for the support and commitment from each of the national and international steering committee member whose names are in our website. And I would like to thank individuals who have been submitted their abstract about works to share their knowledge and make their cases. Thanks to all RAT staff and the conference secretaries and the CNS team who have been working tirelessly behind the scene. And I would like to thank the conference sponsor for their unwavering commitment and encouragement even during this difficult time. Among them are UNFPA, IPPF East Southeast Asia and Oceania region, the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, Family Planning 2020, RFSU, IPAS, 
Bill and Melinda Gates Institution for Population and Reproductive Health, Mary Stoke, Cambodia, PSI, Vietnam Public Health Association, and YP Asia Pacific, among others. Without their valuable and heartfelt support, we would not be able to have this forum. And I would like to thank each and all of you who participate in this virtual conference today and in the future, our collective commitment make this virtual conference possible and surely a success one. And thank you. And over to you, Shobha. Thank you very much, Dr. Hua. And uh, I welcome once again the viewers to the first session of 14 sessions of APCR SHR 10 virtual. Today's session is on the theme of addressing barriers to accelerate progress on sexual and reproductive health and rights in Asia Pacific. And we have today one plenary speaker and four abstract presenters. And now I welcome our plenary speaker for today, Professor Caroline Homer, who is co-program director, maternal child and adolescent health at the Burnett Institute. And she's visiting professor of midwifery faculty of health University of Technology, Sydney. Professor Homer is a leading midwifery researcher in Australia and has an international reputation as a scholar and leader in maternal and newborn health care and service delivery. She has more than 25 years of experience in the sector and in June 2017, she was awarded the Order of Australia for Distinguished Service to Medicine in the field of midwifery as a clinician, researcher, author, and educator. You, have you are wearing many, very many caps, Professor. Professor Homer will be sharing her insights on addressing barriers to accelerate progress on SRHR in Asia Pacific. Over to you, Professor. Thank you very much, Shobha. I'm hoping that you can all hear me. I yes, would like very to, Sorry. very good, and to thank Dr. Var as well for his warm welcome and to express my sadness at not being able to be all together in Cambodia last month. But I acknowledge the incredible creativity of the organizing committee and the sponsors to make this virtual event happen. So congratulations and, and thank you for enabling that to happen. Um, as Shoba said, my name is Caroline Homer and I am by background a midwife and I've been working uh, with colleagues in the Asia Pacific region now for many years, mostly through uh, my colleagues in UNFPA and very fortunate to also have worked in Cambodia a little bit um, with some of the people who are online today. So given you have all come to a uh, online conference about sexual and reproductive health and rights. Much of what I'm going to say in the next 10 minutes, you know already. But I thought perhaps given this is the first uh, talk at, on the virtual conference for the next six months, perhaps I would just go over some of the issues that we know about the barriers. We know that SRHR is essential for human development, for sustainable development, for countries to reach the SDGs. There's enormous links with SRH and gender equality and women's well-being. And we know the impacts go far beyond uh, just now. They are um, into the baby, the child, into adolescence and into the next generation. And we know that countries that have strong and effective SRH are have very strong economic development and it's better for environmental sustainability. So these are not women's rights, these are not women's issues, they're everybody's issues. And they're for every country to make strong decisions and strong implications around. And we know that everybody has uh, a right to make decisions about their bodies that free of stigma, free of discrimination and free of coercion. And these are important issues that you all know and that's why you are here today. We have an enormously diverse region and the Asia Pacific region is, is more than 30 countries with a range of um, economic development, a range of challenges, a range of humanitarian situations. 
So much of what I say sounds like I'm just, the whole of the region is one thing, but we know that's not the case. We know that the region is diverse and very interesting and actually the powerhouse of the world at the moment. So there is so much to learn from one another um, as well as, as in a global sense. I've been putting up a slide like this now for a very long time and um, one day I hope I don't have to put up the slide. The slide says, is there a problem? And you know, we know that there is a problem. Not enough women have access to health facilities. More than 30 million women a year do not give birth in a health facility. 45 million have inadequate or no antenatal care. And more than 2 million women want to avoid pregnancy but cannot use modern contraception. And these data, you know, too many unsafe abortions take place. Too many men and women need treatment for STIs. We are still seeing new infections of HIV across the world, especially in low to middle income countries. And we see high rates, nearly one in three women experiencing intimate partner violence or non-partner sexual violence. We still have a problem. And that is why you are here today. And we know that the problems vary across the region. This is from Papua New Guinea, this photograph. The issues in Papua New Guinea are not the same as the issues in Cambodia or the issues in Bangladesh or the issues in Fiji. We have to think about context always, about what is right for the country uh, that is um, being discussed or having plans made. And one size will never fit all. But sadly, many of the issues are similar across countries and they are similar even in high income countries as well as low to middle income countries. In SRHR we also address issues like fertility um, which are very often just uh, services available just for people who have money. Uh, we now know cervical cancer is completely preventable with effective vaccines but we are still seeing about a quarter of a million women die each year from this uh, cancer. And issues that men also suffer, STIs, prostate cancer, uh, often related to a lack of services or stigma and norms about masculinity that discourage them from seeking health care. So SRHR is, is not a women's issue, it's not a man's issue, it's all of our issue and it's a societal issue. These beautiful young women I took a photo of some years ago in Timor-Leste, they will be now grown up uh, beyond adolescence probably. But for me, they indicate the great strength in the region, particularly around young people. We have an enormous population of young people in the Asia Pacific region. 27% of our population are adolescents, are young people. And this is the future. This, these young people, these beautiful young women here and the little boy in the background is the future. And so we must build on this future uh, for a better world. Schooling is critical. And while this talk is about health, you all know that schooling is absolutely related to health. It's related to gender equality, it's related to opportunity, and it's related to a country's economic development. And while our region, uh, East Asia, the Pacific, South Asia, we are, we are doing well, we're heading in the right direction. We are not enough. This is not enough here. Uh, and this purple one is not enough. And that's about seven years of schooling. We need more. The girls in our region, we need to give them more. They expect more and they deserve more. Just to highlight the importance of adolescence, and I've, I've talked about the 1 billion young people in the Asia Pacific region between 10 and 24 years, 27% of our population. But people don't have, young people don't have enough knowledge of HIV. They are having pregnancies that are unintended. They are having child marriage that they did not choose or did not want. And there is discrimination, stigma against LGBTIQ young people in all of our countries. And these are the challenges that we are struggling with and these are barriers to effective services. So these are very common that you will know about, a lack of access, a lack of availability, 
a lack of affordability and a lack of acceptability are barriers to care. Acceptability is absolutely linked to quality. If we have poor quality care, the community will not accept it. They will not go out of their way to access it. They will not walk for half a day. They will not pay for a bus if the services are not of quality. And so across our region, there are limited opportunities often to seek effective quality health care. And this is an enormous barrier and contributes to inequalities and inequities. We see very big power imbalances and some countries in our region see this more. Some countries have a much more patriarchal society than others. And some countries do not value women, women in leadership, women in government, women in positions of power. And we also know as women get educated, as women become leaders, they do get into positions of power or even they are just employed and have their own income it increases the risk of family violence. And we are seeing that uh, sadly in higher rates across the region because of COVID-19. In my own country, uh, there, there are 26 weeks of the year so far, there are 27 women who have been allegedly murdered by their partners or by a close family member in that time. 27 women in 27 weeks in my country. We have nothing to be proud of. And I see it across the region. There are examples across Asia and even this week in Papua New Guinea and across the Pacific of family violence. And sadly, COVID-19 has made them worse. COVID-19 has also exacerbated many of the other barriers, particularly access and availability. Um, as a response has meant many services have been pivoted to be providing COVID-19 uh, responses rather than SRH care. So it's a big challenge for us this time. Dr. Ted Ross said recently, all countries must find, strike a fine balance between protecting health, minimizing economic and social disruption and respecting human rights. And you know that every day when you go out and for many of us who are working at home, this has made a big difference for many people who have lost their jobs, who have lost their incomes and huge social disruption and isolation. And at the moment, many of our countries are making difficult decisions about the response to COVID, but also essential healthcare delivery. And we don't, we know that more women will die uh, in childbirth in this COVID time than should have, not because of COVID. We know that children will, are more likely to be wasted. We know that women will lack access to safe abortion or will have more unsafe abortions during this COVID time because of the shift in response. And I know that many services will become more challenging, particularly around the lack of PPE and concerns about staff safety, health worker safety. We've seen across the world Health workers, particularly nurses, midwives, doctors, community health workers struck down by COVID and many of them have died. And this is a tragedy. We cannot afford to lose healthcare workers and we cannot afford to lose one healthcare worker. So to lose many um, is an enormous tragedy. Women's rights and choices, rights to sexual and reproductive healthcare must be respected regardless of their COVID status. So while we've seen a lot of indirect effects from COVID with services disrupted, we also see direct effects with women who are suspected of having COVID uh, denied care or being subjected to discrimination and stigma. So across the region, I've been very impressed about how quick guidance has been developed. It's been quite phenomenal and I'd like to pay tribute to my colleagues at UNFPA, WHO, JAPIGO, and many other agencies, IPF, IPPF, uh, Family Planning, have really developed guidance so quickly. And it, and it is an example that capacity can be built really fast. Um, the challenge now is to get it into practice. These are just some of the guidance. This is uh, guidance from WHO, the second edition uh, already only in June. This is guidance this week released from JAPIGO. Uh, 
UNFPA's guidance has, uh, it, again, it's in his second, it, its second iteration. The, the space is moving so fast that people are developing more guidance. Technical brief for maternity services. This is how to deliver pregnancy care and postnatal care in COVID time using um, to be safe. Again, similarly um, from UNFPA for family planning, the International Confederation of Midwives and also the International Council of Nurses have both produced some incredibly useful resources for nurses, midwives and other healthcare workers. Um, and of course, practical considerations to keep providing services. So we have barriers related to our COVID response. We must consider some principles in this time. And actually, when I wrote these principles, I thought they're actually the principles always. They're not just in a COVID time, they're always. And they're principles we should all think about all the time. Of course, a pandemic, a humanitarian situation, a high refugee crisis, these sharpen us to these principles, but they are the same. Prioritize essential health services, adapt to changing contexts and needs. I've been impressed during this period of how quickly providers have changed, how quickly you have all thought of providing new ways of delivering services, new ways of delivery settings and platforms, using telehealth, using um, digital communications, having new and effective patient flows at all levels, rethinking where patients should go, where people should go, how to deliver the services, and rapidly optimizing the health workforce. It's been incredible to see the work that people have done across the region. We know we need medicines, equipment and supplies. Uh, medicines, we always need medicines, equipment, we particularly need protective equipment, PPE, to ensure uh, that everybody is safe, particularly our staff, and that we fund public health and remove financial barriers to access. We cannot have people not receiving tests, not receiving essential care, not receiving uh, being at, be able to be cared for by people wearing PPE or having other services related to COVID um, if they cannot afford it. Communication is critical. Monitoring must continue. We mustn't forget this um, in an in a emergency time. And as I said before, using digital platforms. We have growing internet connectivity across the region. Many of your countries have very good internet and very good services. And so we must build on this. This is our new opportunity. It's important, as I think Dr. Var said at the beginning, the poorest and the most vulnerable. We must pay special attention to these groups to ensure universal health coverage. The most vulnerable people must be our biggest emphasis always. And we have to work in advocacy and that's why this conference was going to be so important and we now will do it virtually around advocacy around taking actions beyond our health sector to change social norms, laws and policies. And looking at the people who are on the conference today, I know many of you work in this area. You work for civil society, you work for NGOs, you work in advocacy, you work in government. And this is the work that's really important now. And we must have reforms that promote gender equality and give women greater control of their bodies and lives in, in this time and, and always. So when we think about progress in SRHR and we think about the barriers, to address the barriers, we must confront laws, policies, the economy and issues in social norms and values, particularly gender inequality that prevent people from achieving sexual and reproductive health. There are institutional barriers. There are things that we have to change. And in a way, COVID gives us an opportunity to look at those and to change them. It is not good enough anymore to say, that's just how it's done here. That's just how it is in this country. That's just how it is in this region. That's just how it is for these people. We have to challenge that. We have to enable individuals to make their own decisions about their own sexual reproductive health lives and respect the decisions of others. So what can we do? Of course, my last couple of slides, keep SRHR at the center of focus. And I know that's the work that you all do every day. And I pay tribute and admire and uh, 
acknowledge the enormous amount of work that's going on across this region. And as I said, I've been so impressed by how much people have stepped forward. We have to be political. This is not a space to be unpolitical. This is not a space to uh, not engage. And political doesn't mean with a capital P, it doesn't mean running for government or um, being in a position of power. It means engaging with the system. It means engaging with all the players and being advocates, promoting, facilitating and enabling advocacy. We may not always be able to do the advocacy ourselves, but we have to walk alongside and support people who can. Keeping making the problem visible, counting women, counting SRH services, counting uh, things that we can provide and things that we can't provide, counting women every day, using the data and the evidence that we have to make change. As I said, focus on the most vulnerable and the most poor. I think I can say that again because it's so important. And promoting, supporting and growing the health workforce. We can have all the best drugs in the world, all the best technologies and interventions, but if we don't have a health workforce to deliver them, we're not going to get anywhere. So nurses, midwives, doctors, community health workers, pharmacists, uh, radiographers, um, Forgive me who I forget, but uh, all of those engaged in the health workforce. And this is also supporting our support workers, like at the moment, particularly our cleaners, um, transport workers, other people who are delivering services around uh, the, the, the uh, SRH care. And take opportunities. Maybe this is a moment to think of how we could do things differently, just like you have done this conference differently. Is there ways that we can make healthcare different? Is there ways that we can deliver sexual reproductive health services different, education different? Uh, this is a moment, it's disruption, but we must use disruption for good. And so we care for the immediacy and then we use the disruption for good. Thank you very much. I wish you well in the next uh, five months of every fortnight doing this uh, seminar and I look forward to joining um, as we go along. So thank you. I'll hand back to um, Shobha. Uh, thank you very much, Caroline, for such an energetic start to this virtual series. And you have very rightly re-emphasized that everyone has a right to make decisions about their bodies free of stigma, discrimination and coercion and have access to quality as SRS services. And may we all work together despite all odds to make this dream of ours become a reality in our lifetime. And I would say amen to that. And we move on to the abstract presentations now. And the first presenter is Cecilia Roth, who is Senior Education Officer at Family Planning New South Wales, Australia. Cecilia leads a team who provide professional development programs in comprehensive sexuality education to teachers, youth workers, disability workers, and other professionals in schools and the community sector. She will present on opportunities for strengthening sexual health education in schools, findings from a student needs assessment in New South Wales, Australia. Welcome, Cecilia. Thank you very much, Shabha. Yes. Thank you, and it's very, uh, I must thank all the organizers for inviting me to be here today. I feel like I'm in very good company uh, with colleagues from so many different countries around uh, the Asia Pacific and I think some others from further afield. So I feel a uh, great uh, honour to be here today. I'm going to talk to you about um, a study that I did with my colleagues at Family Planning New South Wales in Sydney, Australia, uh, where we looked at the needs of young people and what their experience was of uh, education, comprehensive sexuality education at school. My role working at Family Planning New South Wales, I'm a senior education officer there. So I work in a team of educators where we work with our teachers, uh, people working in the community, disability workers, youth workers, community workers, uh, people working with culturally and linguistically diverse communities, um, our Aboriginal communities and also um, other priority populations. So we wanted to get a sense of when we go out and work with the teachers, what sorts of things are young people saying 
that uh, would really impact and improve the education that they are receiving around reproductive and sexual health. So this was a needs assessment that we did in 2017. So I will share some of the findings from the study and some of the recommendations that came out of that. So, I mean, first of all, a lot of you um, colleagues around the, around the region would be very aware that comprehensive sexuality education is a really important component to having good reproductive and sexual health outcomes in the community. So just to quickly recap, and these come from the UNESCO International Guidance on Comprehensive Sexuality Education, we want to make sure that young people have got correct knowledge, that we challenge some of the myths that are out there, that we can really clarify and strengthen some of those positive values and attitudes, like Shabal was saying, without um, shame and judgment around this area of health. Contrary to popular belief, some people think that the more education that we give young people, they're going to go out and start doing it. Whereas the research tells us the exact opposite. The more information they have, they're actually more likely to wait and think about when they are ready to be sexually active. It will, um, and on average, will delay um, when they start being sexually active. And when they do, they are much more likely to engage in safer sex practices, have less STIs and unintended pregnancies, and really give them the skills to make informed decisions and have uh, healthier relationships. So that's very much at the core of one of the reasons why we did the research was to find out what's happening for young people. What do they need? Um, what do they um, understand that they're getting and what would they like to have more of in their education programs at school. And we really wanted to do that in order to inform the education programs that we provide for teachers and for others in the community who are working with young people. Very much around building the capacity of teachers to be able to do that in schools. And I think the things that we found um, that we recommend for the teachers would also work in community settings more generally. In Australia, we do have a national curriculum which includes uh, reproductive and sexual health in it, and we have a state syllabus as well. But we do have um, quite a lot of flexibility in the way that schools actually implement that curriculum. So schools are at liberty to tailor the education to meet the needs of their community. So there is a lot of variety in the amount of education that young people are receiving, which topics are included and how they're taught. So that's another reason why we wanted to actually find out from young people what their experience was. And it was actually a follow up from a study that we did earlier where we looked at the needs of teachers. Um, so it was one study was complementing the other. So we did, and um, the format of it was an anonymous online survey. We recruited young people through social media, and the criteria was that they had to be in year eight to 12 at school, which means around about year 12 till the, the final year of secondary school, which is around about the age of 17 or 18. And we asked them questions, just some basic demographic information, and asked them about where do they get their information around reproductive and sexual health? We didn't call it um, comprehensive sexuality education because we weren't sure if the young people would know what that was. So we called it relationship sexuality and sexual health education. So that includes sexual health. So that's where you see that RSSH acronym there. We asked them what topics were included and how well they were covered if they found there was enough information. Um, who provided those uh, sessions and largely it was classroom teachers, although they did sometimes get people from outside the school coming to teach and provide information. What sorts of resources were used and were these uh, resources that they found helpful? What resources do they prefer and what um, teaching and learning did they prefer in order for those classes to be effective? And just what was their overall perception of how effective that education program was? So we did some descriptive um, statistical analysis and also some qualitative thematic analysis to just find out what the themes and trends were. Okay, and here are some of the, the results. Just in terms of the participants, we had 1,603 students who completed the online survey and it was a good mix of people from metropolitan, regional and rural areas. 
around about 61% were from government schools, which is proportional to the number of schools that we have in New South Wales, and independent schools and faith-based schools were also um, represented there. As you can see from the pie chart on the left there, the majority of the students were in the older age group. So maybe they just felt a little bit more confident about answering a survey of that nature. So we didn't get as many younger year eight and nine students, but still had some representation there. And I guess one of the, um, the interesting parts of the survey was that young women were much more interested than the young men in uh, filling in the survey. Um, but that's okay, we welcomed them all. And um, we did get around about 3% of students who identified as transgender or gender diverse students. So it was good to have that representation as well. So just looking at some of the results now, um, in terms of the sources, how did they find out about reproductive and sexual health topics? You can see there uh, the, the darker green bar um, is these are the topics where they got most of their information at school. So you can see that topics like puberty, sexual harassment, STIs, and some of the other popular ones like um, just getting to know parts of the body and uh, contraception were fairly well covered at school. And these were actually mostly topics that people mainly learned about from school. You can see also that um, friends were another influence there. And the light green bar there is social media. And social media featured very heavily um, and highly in most of the topics. But you can see particularly some of these topics on the right side there, they are the topics where the students didn't get as much information from school. And you can see that social media and websites is where they tend to get more information from. We don't always know if those sources of information are going to be reliable and current for young people. So, um, but we know that that is where they go if they're not getting the information from school. And that was a trend that we saw right through the study. Looking at um, the amount of information, did the school provide enough information or were the young people feeling like they really hadn't learned enough? With some of those topics, the top five topics there, so puberty, safe sexual practices, STIs, sexual harassment, abuse and bullying, and contraception, we found that the students felt that they were getting a reasonable amount of information. They got a lot of information from school and they were fairly satisfied with that. So school is really a very um, important uh, source of information. So we certainly can see that that coming through um, with those topics. But some of that, the Topics where the students really felt that they were not getting enough information and they wanted a lot more information from school are those five at the bottom. So learning about different gender identities, learning about same sex attraction and sexual identity, learning about porn and re media representations of sex. We know that um, pornography and sexting is something that's becoming um, very easy and accessible for young people to um, to view and we know that that has an influence on the way that they think about sexuality and some of those other concepts around that. So they did want to learn more about that but it wasn't something that was being discussed much at school. The other area was around sexual feelings and desires, the reality of relationships. They felt like there wasn't very much of that um, discussed and they really wanted to learn more about that. And the other one around um, STI treatment and testing which was surprising because Students seem to get information about STIs, but not um, information around how to get tested and how to get treated, how, how that um, sort of the skills and knowledge that they would need to go out and access services. So that was interesting that it was different from just learning generally about STIs. Um, in terms of the ways that young people really wanted to learn, they really wanted to find out about the reality of life and around how people dealt with issues around health. So they wanted to, um, they were very um, keen to have things like videos, um, looking at websites where they could follow up and get more information of themselves after the lessons have happened. They really enjoyed interactive learning activities. They didn't um, they find that it was very interesting or engaging and they, they didn't learn very much if it was more of a lecture style. They wanted to do something where they could be active, um, having, com having uh, discussions and, you know, really using some of that critical thinking to get to the, the depth of learning in these topics. They were very keen to um, find out about people's personal experiences. They wanted real life stories of what people 
um, have experienced and how they've um, overcome problems if they've had um, health problems in this area and have opportunities for open and respectful conversations. The other thing that came through very strongly was that a lot of them felt there was a lack of diversity in the teaching and in the resources that were being used at schools. So um, they really wanted to see a range of different sorts of relationships, different cultural perspectives, different points of view, different body shapes and sizes, and looking at diversity in gender and sexuality as well. So a lot of them were saying that that wasn't really coming through. Overall, um, most students did feel that there was some degree of that they did get some knowledge. It did help them to make decisions and clarify some of the myths, but they really felt like they needed more information overall. So you can see those percentages are small, but there was a lot of diversity. So you can see with the two quotes there below, one student thought that they had a really great program and has started to use that information now that they are in a relationship um, with safe sex. Whereas another student there said, there was really hardly any information, very vague, um, and there were not questions answered. Another thing that came through very strongly was that um, students felt they were getting information that was out of date, um, or resources that were out of date. So they felt that wasn't very effective. So overall, um, the different levels of satisfaction, we did um, cross tabulate to see which groups um, sort of felt more or less satisfied. And we did find, um, generally in the public schools were, were slightly getting slightly more information than some of the faith-based schools, for example. And that transgender and gender diverse students overall felt like they were really not getting information that was relevant to them. And we know that they are more vulnerable to things like um, STIs, um, mental health issues and other um, negative health outcomes more generally as, as well as uh, sexual health outcomes. So it's very important they felt that there was going to be information and resources that were relevant to them so that they could really um, benefit from their education programs. So some of the recommendations, we've really just focused on professional learning for teachers because we think that's a really strong way to build the capacity and um, provide great education to young people. So things like making sure that teachers are aware of best practice approaches, such as you would see in the UNESCO International Guidance Documents, um, those engaging activities, thinking about their language very carefully so that they are using inclusive language and approaches to really look at all those different sorts of um, relationships, body types, agenda, being really inclusive and um, proactive about that making sure they're facilitating critical thinking so that students can really unpack and understand what's happening, um, particularly when you look at things like relationships. Um, and where there are new emerging areas of knowledge where teachers may not feel very confident and may not know exactly what to say, um, that professional development can provide some guidance to teachers around that. Um, and then also making sure that teachers are aware of the, the services in their area and talking to students around how they can access those. So using that health literacy really to um, things like, such as STI testing, how students can access that if they need that, making that just a normal part of life that all students know how to access. Uh, so the other area was just looking at um, appropriate resources. Um, a lot of uh, students said that the resources were very out of date, so or just there were no resources available. And we know that that is one of the reasons why teachers may not spend a lot of time teaching some of those emerging topics where students said there wasn't much information because teachers are lacking resources. So um, one of the other recommendations is that there are um, resources developed, things like fact sheets, things like lesson plans that teachers can use very easily, that they can access them easily online and that um, follow some of those ideas that the young people had around what would make the learning um, interesting and easy for them to understand. So things like using context and personal stories that young people can relate to, reflecting diversity and inclusiveness in the language, and also then using that social media, telling um, students where they can go to get reliable information and that they can share and, uh, and use beyond the classroom. So those are the, some of the recommendations that we, that we made based on the, uh, the feedback from the students. 
So I'll be looking forward to um, hearing some questions. And uh, if people are interested in finding out more, we do have a copy of um, the wider project uh, report available on our website. So if people uh, would like to have a look at that, you're more than welcome to access that. Thanks, everyone. Right. Thank you very much, Cecilia. And it was really heartening to know that schools were a source of a lot of information for these youngsters in your country. And this, unfortunately, is not the case in many countries of the region where uh, sexual and reproductive health is still taken to be married people's problem. And uh, most, most often than not, the children and the adolescents are kept out of it, and which is the reason for so many ills in that field. And therefore, evidence-based, sex-positive, and appropriate approach to comprehensive sexual health education is needed, as you have pointed out very clearly. And I think all schools need to have that. Yeah. Thanks once again. So our next presenter is Khan Wen Fong. Hi, and please excuse me if my pronunciation is incorrect. And Khan is project coordinator at the Research Center for Gender, Family and Environment in Development in Vietnam. She will present on the needs of comprehensive sexuality education of students in Thai Nguyen University, Vietnam. Over to you, Khan. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Thân Nguyễn Phương Hải. Uh, I'm working as a program officer for the Research Center of Family and Environment in Vietnam since 2017 now. And uh, since 2007, I have the experience in working in the themes of uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights for the adolescents and the youth. And uh, at this time, we, uh, we are encouraged in a project that uh, provides the comprehensive sexuality education for the student in a series of uh, some university in Thái Nguyen province. And today it is my honor to be here to present uh, the, uh, the results of the research that focus on the needs of uh, Thái Nguyen University student about the uh, comprehensive um, sexuality education uh, in uh, Vietnam. This is my presentation and uh, this is a part of the, uh, the results of the research that we have carried out in the end of 2019. And the research is uh, to find out the difficulties and the need of the uh, Thái Nguyen University student relating to the sexuality education activity as a basis to develop a comprehensive sexuality education for the university student in Vietnam. And uh, we have in, uh, in get the uh, five uh, Thái Nguyen University units that including the University of Education, University of Technology, University of Medical and Pharmacy, and University of Agriculture and Forestry, and finally is the International, uh, international School uh, of Thái Nguyen University they have uh, engaged uh, in the project and also the research. And uh, our research question, we uh, focus on the three main uh, questions. Firstly is the, what the student have difficulties in searching for and approaching the comprehensive sexuality education information. And the second question is, is the, what uh, the student need to raise their awareness, practice their sexual and reproductive healthcare skill and the final section uh, question we focus on is that to uh, what has uh, CZFED uh, have done to meet the students' demand relating to the providing the comprehensive sexuality education activities there? About the uh, method, we uh, carry out uh, the research both directly and indirectly. For the directly research, we conduct the uh, 
25 in-depth interview and uh, six group discussion. And uh, we, we, we have an uh, interview and uh, carry out the group discussion, not only with the student, but also we carry out uh, the uh, in-depth interview and group discussion with the uh, uh, core staff and the representative of the Youth Union and Student, uh, student Association of the Taiwan University. And another uh, component is that we carry out the online survey and we have attracted uh, 3,860 students uh, from the five uh, university units to uh, uh, approach and to answer the online survey. And the, another component is that we carry out an uh, analysis of the available um, sexual and reproductive health material that has been uh, used and uh, done by the Taiwan University. And during the, uh, the, the, the research, the uh, anonymous information and the own of the ethical research requirement are ensured by the research team and also the CZFAT. And <clears throat> next, uh, next is the finding that we find out the uh, difficulties and challenges in providing the sexuality education for students at Taiwan University. This part I will uh, for, uh, divide in two main parts. The firstly is the difficulties of uh, Taiwan universities in implementing their um, sexual reproductive health activity education activity. Uh, the, the difficulty they have in carry out those activity is that firstly they uh, do not have the specific goals or orientation of the uh, uh, of, uh, implementing those kinds of activity. And the second difficulty is that they are lack of the former comprehensive sexuality program. And the next difficulty is that they lack of the qualified human resource. That means that the lecturer or the, um, uh, the, the core staff who carry out those activity, they are do not trained about the not only the knowledge but also the method how to involve or uh, how to attract their student to actively participate in those activity and the 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 other difficulty is that they um they they lack of shots of reference materials that is um uh, uh, for them to uh, take the reference and the another the most uh, another difficulty is that they are lack of the student awareness needs in uh, participating in all of the uh, activity <clears throat> and next we will move to the uh, difficulties of uh, the student in approaching and uh, seeking uh, seeking the information on SRHI issue uh, the 44.2% of the students said that there is no standard SRHR materials for them to read and learn and 43.6% uh, 40, of the students said that it's uh, easy to assess the information but they are not uh, orient which is the uh, most suitable or which is the right um, information for them to follow because uh, they said that uh, nowadays their smartphone is uh, very available and it is uh, easily accessible to the internet and they just only google some of the information and there's a lot of information for them to uh, to to look and read but they do not have the they, they, they do not know which one is uh, better for them to uh, to learn. And 36.6% uh, of the students share that uh, their family avoids, uh, their family member, especially their parents, often avoid to mention about the issues of sexual and reproductive health and rights at home. 
and uh, 36% of the students said that their lecturers who carry out those activities are still lack of the knowledge and essential skill to teach them about the sexual and reproductive health. And uh, that's the reason why they still feel shy to learn about the uh, SIHI issue because uh, they still afraid of being judged by the other. And uh, this number of students accounts for nearly 26% from the survey. Um, some of the students said that uh, uh, the lecturers are so busy with their own uh, uh, work and teaching and uh, students sometimes afraid to ask them about the, those issues and uh, some of the students said that uh, the lecturer also seems to be afraid to talk about the issue because it's quite a sensitive issue considered. This is the results of uh, the focus group discussion of the uh, University of Education student in another sharing of the third year university student um, uh, of education and uh, is that um, the they actually the university also organized those activity but uh, we are afraid to participate in no one in our room joined those activity because uh, those are quite delicate activities That's the, the server. And the next part of the presentation, I would like to share with you the needs of uh, comprehensive sexuality education activity of Taiwan University, uh, uh, Taiwan University student uh, for the uh, knowledge. Uh, for the knowledge, the most wanted knowledge for those groups is about the uh, sexual transmitted meat, uh, disease and the issues of HIV AIDS. This uh, account for 54.9% uh, of students to raise the issue. And the, the, the second uh, one topic is about the love and sex, uh, which account for nearly 53% of students. And next is followed by the uh, safe contraception and abortion method, which is about 50.5% uh, of students uh, mentioned about those topics as required. And uh, the fourth one is uh, the, the right to enjoy their sexual and reproductive health and right health care which is uh, account for 43.7% of students to mention about this. And followed by the, uh, uh, the needs uh, for the topics of the prevention of uh, sexual abuse and harassment, uh, sexual diversity, sexual orientation, and premarital skill. And also the student would like to propose uh, for the for the forms of communication uh, activities so that they uh, they may be more actively uh, participate and uh, feel more attractive for them to participate. Firstly is the communication activities at a large scale like uh, the talk shows or the contests or use the role play, interactive role play so that they can actively participate uh, into, the, uh, uh, into the process to share their opinion or to raise their voice. And the second uh, proposal is uh, to carry out the small group um, activity, uh, for example, the small group discussion uh, to uh, discuss about their own case study that is uh, related to their lives or the situation. And also the student recommend to utilize the game shows that um, they find it is funny and uh, 
attractive for them to participate in. And also they recommend us to utilize the technical or the smartphone to design uh, the, um, act, these kinds of activity or these games for them to, to participate in. And the finally, um, the final proposal of the student is that uh, we should provide the direct or indirect counseling service so that they can um, anonymously um, approach with the um, counselor or maybe um, uh, did, uh, maybe utilize uh, the uh, um, counseling corner or counseling office that is available at each university because uh, from the um, uh, survey we found that uh, some of the university they still have their own counseling office but uh, the approach of the student is still limited, maybe because uh, the student found it, it is uh, not uh, uh, comfortable for them to come there directly to approach with the counselor. Yeah. And next is uh, some of the sharing of the student about uh, the forms of communication, uh, communication activities. The, the male, one male student of the University of uh, Technical and Technology is that uh, it would be very necessary if there is anyone to listen and uh, share with me whenever I have a psychological problem. And another student from the um, uh, group discussion about the University of Medical and uh, Pharmacy said that a former learning subject on this topic should be developed. Uh, another one said that uh, it's, uh, it's much be better to have the sharing section of the expert or the contest for students to learn or to give the opinion and also the expert there to evaluate whether their opinion or the knowledge is uh, right or not. And the, uh, another idea is that to organize a talk show seminar uh, as small scale training. Uh, there are some of the events that uh, they decide to share their real life situation and how to solve the difficulties they have to encounter in the love. And also they want to have the uh, interact and enjoy the games uh, for comfort, not just learning the theory. So what CZFED has been uh, from uh, <clears throat> uh, from uh, 2018 to now to meet the students' demand. In the year one, we focus on uh, three main uh, activity. Firstly is the to create the foundation for the project uh, to the initial planning meeting or workshop with the uh, uh, stakeholder of the project. And then we, uh, and also we uh, established a project management group, the coordinator group from the, uh, who are the representative from the universities to have the regular meeting as a basis to update and to share the, uh, the information with each other. And also we have the annual meeting and sharing workshops with each other as well. And the second, uh, activity is that we carry out the baseline research that is focused on to explore the knowledge, awareness and uh, practice of the Taiwan University student about the sexual and reproductive health and rights. And uh, this presentation today is a part of the results from the research. And the final activity of, year, uh, of the year one is that we uh, carry out the critical assessment of the current uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights curriculum 
uh, that is um, available and uh, not only in Thái Nguyên University but also across uh, Vietnam uh, from with a purpose that uh, from the assessment we and to combine with the results of the baseline research we will uh, uh, designed and developed a new comprehensive sexuality education uh, curriculum for the student at Thái Nguyên University as a uh, as the most suitable for them to meet their demands or needs. And for the year two, um, up to now, we we have. Uh, uh, develop a new sec uh, comprehensive sexuality uh, 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 curriculum uh, with a new curriculum, new teaching materials, uh, new teaching methods that has been applied and uh, it has been, uh, now we are at this program that, that is uh, to test and uh, to finalize the new curriculum. Uh, and uh, um, maybe we hope that at the, um, before the September, we will finalize the curriculum because we are now at the uh, progress of uh, testing the uh, curriculum uh, with the um, by the the, the um, university lecturers and the, um, to teach the curriculum to teach and to apply the uh, curriculum to um, carry out the training or the. Uh, um, uh, communicate certain activities with the st uh, student at uh, Thái Nguyên University. And another, another action is that we have a, uh, established a task force uh, in uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights task force that includes the uh, representative from the uh, student association, the youth union and the lecture, uh, core lecturer and also the healthcare staff based on those uh, university and uh, faculties to, uh, with the purpose that they will collect the information and share the knowledge relating to sexual and reproductive health and rights regularly, both um, directly and uh, uh, indirectly we, uh, through the websites, uh, the uh, Facebook or the Zalo group. Uh, and uh, the target groups of uh, this activity is to focus on the student at the university participate in the project and also the student from the other university under the Thái Nguyên University and also with the national network of the student association and the just union. And uh, now we come to the conclusion from the, uh, the research is that each of the uh, university actually they have their own related sexual and reproductive health and rights education activity but they still does not miss the need uh, and the expectation of their student and the secondly is that the Thái Nguyen University student they really want to be educated on the topic of uh, love and sex the safe contraception and abortion methods prevention of sexual abuse and premarital life scheme to the methods of promoting the student and uh, participation. So that's the reason why we, we hope that in the next two years, CZFED will uh, uh, support the um, Thái Nguyên University to develop a pilot model of a comprehensive sexuality education as a basis to replicate in other uh, university among the uh, Thái Nguyên University groups and other university in Vietnam. And uh, now we comes to the end of my presentation about the needs on uh, sexual, uh, comprehensive sexuality education activities of Thái Nguyên University student Vietnam and if there's anything that you want to be more clear or want me to uh, there's any question uh, for me please do not hesitate to 
question me or to send me via email, you are welcome. And thank you for listening my presentation. Thank you very much, Khan. And congratulations mm -hmm. to the excellent work your organization is doing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, as your findings show, more often than not, it is the elders like parents and teachers who are really responsible for young people not getting correct information and timely information around uh, the sexual and reproductive health. Uh, they have no person to share, no knowledgeable person to share their problems with in a rights-based manner. And uh, in many societies, at least in uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia, uh, anything, even uttering anything related to sex is still a cultural taboo and it is best brushed under the carpet. And uh, I think this lack of knowledge is one reason behind many sex-related problems which the adolescents, youngsters, and even adults face, including sexual and gender-based violence. So, the good work you are doing. Congratulations for that. And our next abstract is by Jolly May Catalan and Jolly's project evaluation officer at the Commission on Population and Development uh, with the acronym of POPCOM uh, in the Davao region uh, in Philippines. Now POPCOM implements population and development programs in the Philippines and Jolly's research interest uh, is about internal migration, particularly intra-regional and inter-regional movements and age pattern of migration. Her presentation is on an analysis of the age pattern of migration in Metro Manila and its sex differentials, 2005-2010 migration period. Over to you, Jolly. Hello, Shauba. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, thank you. Uh, so first of all, I would like to thank the APCHRSRH for NCNS for conducting these activities that have been in-person conference and pushing through this virtual series for us to share about S SRHR. So, good afternoon, everyone. I am Vali Mika Talan uh, from Commission and Population, Davao Region of the Philippines. So, I will be sharing with you the age pattern of Metro Manila. As, as a background for the Philippines, as you can see, this is our map. Uh, we are in archipelago and the region that I will be discussing is in the northern part of the country, in just a very small area, the National Capital Region. So, uh, just a short recap. Uh, for the first two presentations, they address specific concerns on SRHR by contextualizing the opportunities and the need for sexual health and sexuality education. Uh, for my presentation, uh, we step back and know about how we can progress on SRHR by looking into a specific population group uh, who are the migrants. So, um, migrants or migration is defined as a geographic or spatial mobility of people involving a change of usual residence uh, during a specified period of observation for a reason such as economic, social, and political and cultural uh, reasons. Uh, migration can be a good or a challenging experience. Uh, in every individual, there are different reasons why a person migrates. And according to UNHCR, um, there are cases when migrants are put in a vulnerable situation. Uh, they categorize this into two. First is the situational vulner vulnerability of the migrants where uh, uh, it refers to the circumstances in route of a destination. This refers to the uh, network that a migrant goes through. Uh, this goes through the mode of transportation, specifically for the Philippines. Uh, it says it's an archipelago. Uh, we cannot go to an area to, from one region to the other without uh, using an airplane or through uh, boats. And then it also, uh, in the circumstances, it also covers the access of services of a migrant from this area of origin to the destination area. While a uh, migrant is also considered uh, vulnerable uh, because of it, of her individual characteristics. For an example, in terms of uh, age, uh, children traveling alone is also vulnerable for 
uh, child trafficking or exploitation. While for those um, in the older persons uh, who have chronic diseases, when they travel alone, they are also considered as part of the vulnerable groups. Whereas by sex, uh, females are, who are pregnant and are traveling or are migrants is also considered as an, a vulnerable group. So in the case of Metro Manila, uh, uh, it has recorded to have the lowest uh, fertility rate and lowest mortality rate. However, uh, it has a second top destination of migrants. But in general, it is observed to be an out-migration region. Uh, when we say out-migration region, even though it is the second top destination of migrants, there are more people who out-migrate in the region. Uh, in population, when fertility and mortality rates are low, migration is projected to shape the population composition. So let's focus through population composition. When we say population composition, almost all, all of the social scientists or economists or all the policy makers are always concerned to uh, what is this, what is the age or what is the sex of the distribution of these populations. Uh, since it affects the uh, social, economic, and cult uh, cultural uh, setting in a community. For an example, uh, when we, uh, in terms of the number of women who need family planning, uh, the number of women who need maternal care, uh, the, how many will be part of the labor force, how many of them will be employed, how many were females, how many will be uh, prospect to be part of uh, a marital union and how many will be retiring, how many will be uh, in the elderly who, who, are, who are females, who are males. So given the characteristics of Metro Manila having a high, uh, very high population in, by 12.9 million and it's categorized as the 18th most inhabited megacity in the world uh, and has a very high population density, this quite uh, interesting to know the migration characteristics given it's one of the um, process that shapes its population composition. So throughout the discussion, uh, I will be showing to you the age patterns of in-migration and out-migration of Metro Manila by sex. And I will also be discussing the profile by sex, education, and wealth status. And later on, I will compare the uh, in-migration by my set and the out migration my set. Throughout the slides, age pattern of migration will refer to the shape, form, the increase, and decrease in the percentage distributions of migrants by age. According to Rogers and Castor, and as also concurred by Wilson, there are age regularities of migration, meaning uh, most of the age profile of migrants follows a certain pattern uh, in this form. It could be labor migration dominant where there is a high migration among young adults. As you can see, this is an example of a labor migration dominant. So as in the young adult ages, there is a high migration among poor. And then it could also be a family migration dominant, wherein uh, there is an almost equal percentage among children and the young adults. Uh, accordingly, Bernard Bell and Charles Edward have also concluded that uh, the life course events of an individual are the proximate determinants that shapes the age profile. Uh, it could be their entry to higher education, uh, their completion in, in schooling. For an example, when someone uh, goes to from one city to attend to another city because of uh, the available program that he wants is only available in the city. And then when someone graduates uh, that individual can go back again to, the, to his or her home country. Uh, additionally, one of the major reasons of migration is also the, in search for employment. Uh, in some cases, uh, in most cases, uh, there are uh, economic imbalances, especially um, more of the developments are usually situated in urban areas and those who are living in rural areas and to go to the urban areas to have more opportunities for, for their employment. And next is the union formation. For in some cases, when um, 
when individuals marry uh, one one or both of the of the of the couple will settle for a new place or one of the partners will, will go to where they tried they will plan to to settle and for childbearing in some places uh, it causes uh, a couple to to transfer to areas where they can uh, rear their children in a more suitable environment and for some cases uh, divorce is also one of the reasons for for one that women migrate and children's departure and retirement so uh, when we say life force events uh, individually uh, there are different timelines or different ages that one can take um, a transition but in every life course events, there is a specific or a, an age where this life events peak. For the case in the Philippines, age pattern of attendance to education, this usually happens in 5 to 19 years old. While for the age pattern of labor force participation, this usually around ages 15 to 19 years old. And for the marital union, according to na the National Demographic and Health Survey in 2017, the peak age of marital union and Fertility is of age just 25 to 29. Uh, for the data used in the profiling of migrants and in the comparison of um, the age pattern of in-migrants and out migrants, uh, I used the 2010 Census of Population and Housing from the Philippine Statistics Authority. So from that census, uh, there is a question that states that asks where did the household reside uh, in year 2015, at the year 2005. So, for an individual to be categorized as an in-migrant, they reported that the regional address in 2005 is in another region. And in 2010, they reported that the regional address is Metro Manila. For out-migrants, uh, those are individuals who reported that the regional address in 2005 are in Metro Manila, and then in 2010, the regional address is in other regions. To ascertain the similarities and the similarities of the in-migrants and out-migrants, uh, index of the similarities, median age, and the test of proportion using key tests per age group were computed. So for the distribution of in-migrants and out-migrants, uh, there are around 285,000 in-migrants and 463 out migrants of Metro Manila. Uh, to know the profile of these migrants, as we can see, um, there are more females among in migrants compared to out migrants. In terms of education, uh, there is a higher percentage of those who have below high school education among out migrants compared to in migrants. And this shifts when educational attainment increases. As you can see, uh, there are more in-migrants in compared to out-migrants among those who, who reach high school education. And then for those who reach above uh, college and higher education, uh, there is a higher in-migration compared to out-migration. For the wealth status, uh, there is a higher percentage of those who belong in the lower wealth status are out-migrating compared to those who in-migrate. So the difference is very high. Uh, this could indicate that those who are um, below, uh, in the low wealth status, um, they, uh, Metro Manila is known to have a high cost of living. And maybe due to this, uh, they tend to out-migrate to settle for areas that it's more affordable for them and it's more easier for them to survive and on the upper extreme for those who belong in the high wealth status you can see that those who can uh, those who are in the high wealth status they can afford to immigrate in metro manila and settle in in metro manila since they have the capacity to to live or they can afford the cost of living and then lower percentage for those who cost migrate so for the specific age pattern of in-migrants and out-migrants, so this is the age pattern of in-migrants. 
as you can see, uh, this is, there is a, the peak age of in migration is in ages 20 to 24. This denotes a labor dominant age pattern of migration. Uh, in comparison, the age pattern of out migrants it shows a, ver a very different age pattern, especially in ages 5 to 39. Uh, this denotes a fam family migration dominant. Uh, the percentage of young children migrating is almost equal to young adults migrating in ages 25 to 29 and 30 to 34. Uh, look, uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, ages 25 to 29 is the peak age where uh, marital unions are be, uh, as a life course succession is being uh, experienced as an individual in the Philippines. And it goes through until age 30 to 34. So looking into the demographics of uh, Metro Manila, uh, Metro Manila being a, uh, a highly urbanized area, it could, say, it could denote that uh, this family could have settled to a different uh, region so that they could raise or rear a family. Whereas for immigrants, since uh, Metro Manila is a highly urbanized area where employment is they, the, the, the mindset of those migrants is set that with that urbanization, there's a lot of employment opportunities. So, next is the comparison of the age pattern of out migrants by sex. So, uh, among out migrants, uh, we can see that it's almost resembles the Family, mig family migration dominant, the same with the general population of Metro Manila, but comparing by sex, uh, children have had, in ages five to nine, uh, males have a higher percentage of migration. Uh, this could possibly be attributed to the uh, sex ratio that uh, during, for children, there are more males who are being born compared to females. And then, so this, this children goes with their and with their parents in ages 30 to 34. Uh, as you can see, there is a large, a significant gap in ages 20 to 24 and 25 to 29. Uh, this, this indicates that females migrate and higher percentage of these young females migrate earlier compared to males. For in migrants, uh, it still shows a labor dominant migration, the same with the general population of Metro Manila. And still, you can see that there is still a high percentage of males who in migrate among those five to nine. And again, here, uh, compared to out migration, there is a high migration in ages 15 to 19 among women. Uh, Metro Manila is also known to have uh, universities that are are top ranking in the country. So there are three uh, top three universities in the Philippines is located in Metro Manila. So one of the possible reasons could be driven by this high percentage of females. And then this this percentage is continuously increases in ages 20 to 24. And later on, as age groups increases, you can see that males have a higher percentage of migration compared to females. Uh, according to, to Brown, uh, males tend to migrate later in life when they become an, uh, income earners or breadwinners of the family. Compared to females, uh, they are also projected to migrate earlier because they take uh, life course events earlier, such as marriage or childbearing compared to, 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 compared to their male counterparts. So from the findings, you can see that there is a sex differential in terms of the age pattern of migration, not just in a general population, but we, can, but we all know that females have a higher percentage, but specifically in each age group, it is very dominant that among immigrants, there is a high difference in 20 to 24. There is a high migration in 20 to 24. Then for out migrants, there is a high family, uh, possible, uh, possibility of high family, family migration. Um, specific for females, uh, it is observed that female immigrates earlier 
uh, with a higher percentage compared to males. And then for out-migration, still females are younger compared to uh, males. So for the implications of these findings, uh, I focus on, on the organization that I'm working with. So there are a lot of attributes to the age group that shows the peak age of immigration and out migration. But let's focus on the age group of 20 to 24. Um, according to literature, these are the childbearing ages or these are those who are, who are in need of family planning services and access to maternal neonatal or child care. Uh, in the Philippines, the Commission on Population is one of the um, government agencies that, that has a flagship program on responsible care for and family planning. Uh, the organization caters and saves uh, data about these women, but there are no ways to, to track down if this individual migrates to another area uh, there's no mechanism for referral that this, this individual or this female are being catered for the services that they want. So to, to answer that kind of gap, it is highly noted to have population register. Um, according to the NFPA, they have noted that women don't stop getting pregnant even though they migrate. And in the process of transition and the process of migration, women are more vulnerable and young children are mo more vulnerable to have uh, health conditions and uh, family planning needs in, when, they got, when they migrate. So to have a, in, in general, to, to update this kind of profile, it is uh, important to conduct and update a national migration survey. Thank you very much, Jolly, for a very interesting and informative data that you have presented. And uh, our last but not the least presenter for today is Rainer K. Jinchan. And he currently serves on the perspectives panel at the BMJ owned journal Sexually Transmitted Infections. And he's an associate editor for the social determinants of health section of the journal, of the journal BMC Public Health. Uh, Rainer's current research uh, employs social epidemiological perspectives to investigate how social determinants of health impact health outcomes in the area of HIV and other sexually transmitted infections mm -hmm. and substance use. And he will present on experienced homophobia and suicide ideation in young, gay, bisexual, and queer men, exploring the mediating role of depressive symptoms, self-esteem, and outness in the pink, car pink carpet Y cohort study. Over to you, Rainer. All right. Uh, thank you, Shobha. Can you hear me uh, loud yes. and clear? Yes, we can. Okay, that's great. Um, so I, I know I don't have too much time, uh, you know, so I'll try to make this a, a quick uh, presentation. So I, I, thank you I, very much for that. Because <laughs> no worries. Um, so I, I am very privileged to be presenting. And, you know, I think one thing that I just want to uh, say before I start on my presentation proper is, um, you know, to give a shout out to um, all the collaborators and those who have helped in this process. So definitely to Timothy, who uh, you know is my colleague and uh, assistant, who helped out with the data, um, as well as you know from my school, the South York School of Public Health at NUS or National University of Singapore, Action for AIDS Singapore, Gay Health and uh, one of the programs, the Pink Carpet Y program. You know, I'll talk slightly more about it later. So today's topic will be on experience homophobia and uh, suicide ideation in young gay, bisexual, and queer men. Uh, you know, I'll be discussing maybe some potential pathways between these two uh, uh, variables. So a little bit of a background. Um, why suicide? You know, so I think suicide is uh, recognized as a public health issue. So according to the World Health Organization, um, you know, global group suicide mortality rate uh, is 10.6 per 100,000 persons. You know, they also uh, mentioned that your know, men compared to women, um, those who stay or reside in Europe and Southeast Asia compared to the rest of the world, and higher income countries compared to lower middle income countries uh, report higher rates of uh, uh, suicide mortality. And of course, this is imperfect data because, you know, I think it has to be interpreted with caution. It doesn't mean that uh, these groups are actually more vulnerable, but, you know, there are also issues around uh, whether suicide is attributed to the deaths or, you know, whether it's actually captured in the reporting. And also there are other social determinants of health that, you know, make this a complex issue as well. Uh, when we talk about suicide-related behaviors, you know, I think one thing that I wanted to point out is that, you know, we there are many ways of conceptualizing it. 
And I think more commonly, they talk about suicide intent or ideation, which is the intent to die. Uh, and suicide attempts, uh, you take that and you add on the element of harming oneself. Uh, that will be classified as suicide attempt. However, you know, the ways in which that this is measured or asked uh, throughout studies is not consistent. Uh, why suicide in young gay, bisexual and queer men, or you know, I'll just use GBQ men, uh, you know, they're actually more likely to exhibit suicide related behavior compared to the heterosexual counterparts. You know, there's also a, a nuance in that, you know, transgender youth uh, are at greater risk of suicide than their cisgender uh, counterparts among GBQ men as well. Um, among suicide deaths in the US, the proportion of uh, deaths were largely around uh, among younger sexual minorities compared to older sexual minorities, indicating that you know, suicide takes place at a, a younger age for sexual minorities. And you know, we see this uh, across the globe as well, you know, not just in uh, Western settings, but you know, in uh, East Asia, some examples here too. Um, so what are the risk factors for suicide ideation and what does the literature tell us about uh, suicide in young GBQ uh, men? Um, so, you know, these are a whole list of risk factors. I won't go through them uh, one by one. You know, and I, one thing I want to point out is that actually quite a lot of them overlap, you know, with the kind of risk factors for, you know, the general, general society, general um, individuals, right, who do not identify as uh, GBQ men. Uh, but, you know, I think one thing uh, that the literature points out is that some of these uh, uh, risk factors are exacerbated, um, you know, in young GBQ men, you know, for example, when it comes to peer victimization and a uh, homophobic bullying, you know, there's an element of a stigma associated with one's sexual identity. Um, there's the whole um, process of coming out, a disclosure of one's sexual identity, um, you know, makes it uh, uh, quite a distressing or a stressful time uh, for young GBQ men. And also it affects their relationship uh, with traditional support structures, you know, which are typically uh, religion, family, you know, in a context where, uh, you know, there's high stigma, you know, it, it, it actually causes, um, you know, both uh, external pressure on the individual and it reduces the number of protective factors available to the individual as well. Uh, so these are the risk factors for suicide ideation and attempts among young GBQ men. Um, so a little bit of the setting for Singapore, I won't go into too much detail. Um, you know, I think for Singapore, uh, it is uh, considered a high income country. But I think for when it comes to uh, uh, LGBTQ plus uh, issues, uh, you know, I think uh, we, we in Singapore remain quite conservative, especially institutionally. So as of now, sexual relations between men uh, is still criminalized based on Section 377 of the Penal Code. Um, and actually past studies and quite recent studies have found that most Singaporeans perceive same-sex relationships as being wrong. Uh, they are against the idea of uh, gay marriage or not in favor of the repeal of Section 377A. Uh, although, you know, like time series data is showing that, uh, you know, more and more are less uh, against the idea of repealing it. Um, and, you know, I think that's the, the trend as both cohorts uh, change in terms of those who are represented in these surveys. Um, Amongst all these, actually not much is known about the mental health of a young GBQ men in Singapore in spite of, you know, quite a numerous number of organizations in the community sphere who are engaged with uh, individuals um, who identify as GBQ men. You know, uh, at least, you know, from a public health perspective or academically, we don't really know much about it. So, you know, I think this is one of the first few uh, cohort studies that tries to investigate that. So I'll just introduce you to the cohort very quickly. Um, so this is a prospective cohort study. Um, it's the first one uh, to our knowledge in Singapore um, in collaboration with Action for AIDS, Gay Health SG, and their Pink Cup Y program, which uh, serves the needs, uh, sexual and mental health needs of young GBQ men. So we recruited 570 in the uh, analytic sample or the baseline sample, uh, 18 to 25 year old uh, GBQ men uh, who are self-identified uh, gay, bisexual, or queer questioning. Uh, they also self-identify HIV negative or who are unsure of their status and who are cisgender or transgender men uh, as well, or gender queer. So uh, this was actually based on seed funding. Uh, and, you know, we have um, funding to actually carry on this cohort for a total of like one year. So we have a zero, six and 12 month follow-up for this cohort. And we are actually wrapping up the study right now, um, pending further funding. But, you know, what I'm presenting now would be based on the baseline survey. Uh, recruitment was done through you know, numerous organizations in the LGBTQ plus sphere in Singapore. Otherwise, this uh, study would not have been able to be possible. 
Um, this is a whole list of different variables we collected for the uh, cohort study, but you know, the ones that I have bolded um, are the ones that are relevant for this particular study, um, you know, including outness, you know, how, uh, how much or the magnitude of disclosure of one's sexual orientation, um, experienced homosexual stigma, uh, self-esteem, depression severity measured through the patient health question and nine, and uh, suicide-related questions. Uh, Analysis-wise, you know, we use data for analysis, descriptive statistics, logistic regression for uh, looking at relationships. We also use generalized structural equation modeling uh, to look at uh, pathways of path analysis uh, and with the help of the SEM builder um, in Stata as well for this uh, particular uh, uh, purpose. So what are our findings? I will briefly go through this. Um, so these are the demographic characteristics of the sample, uh, find, oh, 570 participants. Uh, you know, I think maybe I won't go through all of them, but I'll highlight certain things. So for ever contemplated suicide or suicide ideation, about 54% of the sample uh, reported uh, ever thinking of uh, 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 dying, you know, suicide ideation. Whereas 13.3% um, of the sample reported ever attempting suicide. Um, in terms of the other um, exposure variables, uh, we see uh, experience homophobia, depression severity, and outness inventory. Um, I think they are what we would call a like right skewed. So actually, um, in a curve, they would be largely towards the lower scores. But you know, actually, any indication of a, a score would indicate that someone has experienced homophobia, or you know, there's a greater depression severity in this individual. You know, and you can see that the variation in terms of standard deviation over here is quite high, indicating that you know there is quite large variation for different individuals. Um, just a very quick taste of uh, different questions that you know are part of the experience homophobia scale. It's a 14 item scale. Um, Chromebox Alpha reliability was 0 0.9, so actually quite quite good reliability. Um, you know, I won't go into details of this, but we actually constructed a score for experience homophobia based on this scale, uh, and it was validated in a study elsewhere. Uh, when we ran uh, the analysis, uh, you know logistic regression, multivariate logistic regression, you know, we found that experience homophobia uh, was associated with ever contemplating, ever attempting suicide in both this model here and this model here. Um, when we ran path analysis, we found that, uh, you know, depression severity, self-esteem and outness all partially explain the association between experience homophobia and suicide ideation, whereas depression severity and outness, um, you know, explain part of their relationship as well. So I'm Zooming past this because you know it's not the most important part. You know, I think one thing we did was that was quite exploratory. You know, now we added all the variables in to a more uh, robust model that had a, a bigger, um, you know, exploratory power. So, with everything in, you know, we found that experience homophobia was still associated with uh, ever contemplating suicide, but the effect uh, was no longer there for attempting suicide. Um, you know, we can see that. In the full model, you know, depression severity and outness still explain part of the association between experienced homophobia and suicide ideation. Uh, and it's the same um, uh, pattern as well, the same um, results for suicide attempts. So I'll just jump into my discussion real quick. Um, so what does the data actually tell us? You know, being one of the first uh, studies to look at suicide ideation and attempts in uh, young GBQ men in Singapore, you know, we find that the rates of suicide ideation and attempts are, you know, relatively high. You know, I think one of the other studies or more a global study found that uh, only lifetime prevalence of suicide ideation was 9%. Um, you know, and I say this with some caution as well because I'm not sure how they uh, asked the question in terms of lifetime prevalence. You know, but I think this is a rather alarming rate from a program perspective as well, you know, if you're, if you're rolling out uh, interventions in the community. You know, experience homophobia is a risk factor for both suicide ideation and attempts. Um, and it's relevant for sexual reproductive health because um, of a syndemic uh, a lens for HIV STI, which actually uh, looks at how um, you know, mental health issues such as, you know, depression, such as substance use, such as uh, past suicide ideation and trauma, you know, they compound each other uh, alongside sexual health outcomes as well. Um, mediation and path analysis show that, you know, depression severity uh, partially accounts for that association. It is quite plausible, you know, actually for this study, we found that the mean age where people, uh, participants were aware of their sexual orientation was 13.2 uh, or, you know, 13 years old. 
And then when, when they first uh, started having suicide ideation and attempts, they were asked about the age at which they first reported that. Uh, it was usually around 16, uh, 16 to 17 years old. So, you know, one assumption is that because the depression severity was measured at the point where they did the survey, uh, an assumption for this would be that, you know, depression severity uh, has remained uh, consistent since uh, they were exposed to experience homophobia. Uh, whereas outness, you know, it's it's a little bit of a, a, a weird kind of um, uh, finding because, you know, I think it's not enough information to draw any conclusions. Um, you know, of course, outness doesn't really tell us about the nature of the relationships between the individual and who they are out to. Because if you're out to someone who is supportive, uh, you might have actually better outcomes. But if you're out to someone who is uh, uh, not supportive of, um, you know, your sexual identity, uh, it might actually lead to uh, worse outcomes for the individual. So down to my final slides, I think, last two. Um, limitations, I just mentioned that, you know, these are present, me present measures of depression, severity, self-esteem and outness versus past suicide-related behaviours. You know, we have to assume that these remain consistent across, uh, you know, the, the, those few years between uh, when they had suicide ideation or attempts and now. Uh, you know, we require a prospective cohort study among even younger GBQ men uh, to discuss this. There might be selection bias, you know, those who are more out or comfortable with their sexual orientation are more likely to participate in this study um, and there might be social desirability bias. So for the questions on suicide ideation or suicide attempts, actually quite a large number of people decided to say that they prefer not to mention, uh, prefer not to say for the responses to suicide ideation or attempts, but you know, to be conservative and not draw wrong conclusions around it, you know, we recorded them as you know, never contemplated or never attempted um, so that if any um, association comes up, we can actually attribute it to uh, that particular association. Um, strengths, I guess, is the first study on uh, mental health, uh, academically at least, uh, among young GBQ men in Singapore, uh, where sexual relations between men is criminalized, you know, I think hasn't been done too much of because of a prevailing stigma. Uh, there's strong evidence for association between experienced homophobia and past suicide related behaviors. And, you know, I think it also is a nice study to really. Uh, be serve as a platform to go on you know, qualitative studies, you know, what is the life cost of a suicide, what are the narratives around suicide among young GBQ men, how does depression, how does outness play into that, you know, I think these are interesting things to think about. And finally, for recommendations, um, you know, I think based on this data, it shows that people start questioning their sexual, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, sexual identity from as young as 13 years old, you know, uh, I think based on what we have now in schools, uh, it does not really cover this whole process. So perhaps school-based and NGO-based programs can help buffer the impact of stigma. Um, in general, also stigma reduction in society uh, may be more challenging because I think uh, for uh, social scientists, you know, like countrywide kind of campaigns, um, you know, we're not sure how to do that yet uh, very effectively. Um, in terms of institutionalized uh, stigma reduction, I think that is a bit more within the means of those who are uh, leading institutions and also policymakers. You know, for example, some laws that reproduce stigma. Um, furthermore, there could be some protect protections from discrimination based on sexual orientation, you know, bullying, teasing in school, media representation, in healthcare and religious institutions. At least will help buffer the impact of a stigma and you know, hopefully reduce suicide ideation and suicide attempts. Uh, among GBQ men as well. So with that, um, you know, I think I've come to the end. Just want to acknowledge some of my team members um, and also those who have supported this study and the funders as well. Um, but yeah, you know, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Rainer. It was short and crisp, small is beautiful always. And thank you for bringing up a very important topic and pointing out the role of discriminatory, discriminatory laws for LGBTI community at a bit homophobia in many countries of Asia Pacific region and have serious consequences as your study has pointed out very clearly. Uh, we have very little time left for the Q&A session. I think we have already overshot the time, but we will definitely take up some questions. Um, uh, Professor Caroline Homer has left already. So she has two questions were there for her. So she has answered them in the chat box and I will read out the answers quickly. I can see three virtual hands raised. So if your question is for Professor Homer, please do not ask. Otherwise, uh, if it is towards, for any other of the presenters, uh, you are free to ask Farhana Zaf Jafri. You wanted to ask a question. And then Sophani Meen and Tatsiden. 
So Farhana, would you like to ask your question quickly, please, if you want to ask? Okay, meanwhile, and yes, yes, please ask quickly. No, no, thank you. I don't want to ask any questions. Okay. It's very clear. Okay. Uh, anybody else who had raised their virtual hand, would you like to ask your question? And if it is not for Professor Homer, please go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, there is a question from Neneta Ortega from Philippines uh, to Than Fong. And uh, Nenet wants to know how do you plan to develop the CSC modules considering the current COVID-19 pandemic, which requires distancing, lesser in-person interaction, potential for schools to be closed and students are at home. So would the presenter yeah. like to answer? Yes, please. Yeah. Yes, uh, that uh, question has been uh, directly answer to okay. the Nenita Ortega. So uh, do I need to yes, uh, answer think, again? Yes, maybe others. Maybe. Okay. Yes. Actually, uh, for this question, we have uh, experienced uh, during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic since March to April because our students, they uh, as have to stay at home uh, nearly three months because uh, at that time, all the school and university in Vietnam has to close due to the required uh, social distancing and uh, to avoid a person to person meet. So we, uh, we moved to, um, we moved to the, um, uh, our way of working is to online working and uh, uh, push up the online activity like uh, uh, promoting the uh, Facebook or the social media in uh, terms of um, in terms of um, providing the knowledge and updating the project activity with the target groups and luckily thanks to the well control of the Vietnam government uh, the everything becomes as usual since May 2020 and then all of the project activity has been carried out as planned and also we we have to admit that uh, some of the project activity has been cancelled uh, during the uh, during the covid uh, 19 uh, pandemic uh, that has uh, uh, blooming in vietnam since uh, march to may uh, for example some of the training with the uh, the international expert or some of the talk show with a last scale that has been cancelled and delayed uh, during that time and uh, since may uh, since may when uh, we are uh, when we are allowed to carry out the trainings with a small number of person around 20 to 25 we have uh, carried out a series of training for the core trainers on the comprehensive sexuality education for student um, uh, for the core uh, for the core lecturer and uh, healthcare staff and also for the core student at Taiwan University and it has really uh, successful uh, acti a series of activity because we not only uh, we do not teach but we uh, inspire them to continue with their own uh, way of um, uh, carry out the sexuality education for their school uh, for their university student and uh, actually we we seen on the progress because uh, luckily the vietnam government uh, the vietnam has not been uh, uh, to uh, has not been uh, applied the social distance since may till now yeah that's the reason why we still uh, have a chance to carry out uh, our project activity as usual as planned thank you Thank you very much that for my, that. Okay. Does my answer satisfy your question? Yeah, thank you. And in response to Rita, Rita Vidyadana's question for Professor Caroline, she has said that uh, uh, we should always focus on the most vulnerable and poor. And I know in times of crisis, these groups get left out, but all of us have to work hard to leave no one behind in COVID-19 times and other times as well. And in uh, reply to... Uh, Tin Mong Thu uh, from Myanmar to his question, 
uh, Professor Homer says that sexual violence is common in developed countries as well as in developing countries, although she doesn't have uh, exact data to share. Uh, and uh, uh, Fox, uh, Fox from Cambodia, I think his question has been answered by uh, Cecilia Roth and also Dr. Chivon Bar has given his comments on his question, so I need not repeat it. And, but I would just like to repeat Dr. Chivon's uh, comment. He says that in Cambodia, we are writing a specific comprehensive sexuality education and RHAC is, RAC, that is, is supporting the Ministry of Health in implementing it in more than 500 schools. So with this, we come to the end of the first session of APCR SHR 10 virtual. And my sincere thanks to the speakers and to the participants for making it so enriching and we really never saw the time and we have really overshot the time for more than half an hour sorry for that but it was you who made it so interesting and energizing and we will meet again on thursday july 9 which is just two days ahead of the world population day and that session will be on strengthening women's rights and choices in a post-covid asia pacific bye till then and stay safe all of you Bye-bye.